brother bishops, fathers, brothers and sisters, friends. Let me begin my words this evening with two quotations, one from an Orthodox spokesman and one from a Catholic. Speaking in 1968, the ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras said, today union is the Ananke, our destiny. And he added, union will be a miracle, but a miracle in history. My second witness is Cardinal Sunans of Belgium, who has said, in order to unite, we must first love one another. In order to love one another, we must first get to know one another. Taken together, these two statements provide the motive and justification for the current Catholic Orthodox dialogue. Union is the Ananke, says Patriarch Athenagoras. It is our vocation as followers of Christ. We seek unity because it is Christ's will. For what did our Lord pray at the Last Supper with his disciples? A crucial moment immediately before his betrayal and death. He would not have prayed on such an occasion for anything secondary or trivial. And in fact, he prayed for unity. May they all be one. We seek unity because it is Christ's prayer, his desire, his hope. Unity will be a miracle, a miracle from the Holy Spirit. The unity of the churches, said Karl Barth, is not a manufactured article, not a human product, but a gift from God. It is our task to remove the human obstacles that hinder this miracle. It is our task to allow the spirit full freedom of action. And we shall not remove these obstacles without love. And mutual love, in the full and true sense, will only be possible if there is mutual knowledge, mutual fellowship. Love for unknown persons is not true love. Now, the unavoidable conclusion from all this is that union is not an optional extra. It is fundamental. And it is the responsibility of all of us, not just of theological experts and church leaders, but of the people of God, the royal priesthood, as St. Peter calls it, in its totality, of the laos of God as a whole. Now there is an evident consequence from all this. As divided Christians, Catholics and Orthodox, we should, so far as possible, do everything together in full cooperation. We should only do a part what we have to do a part. Alas, one of the things that to our deep sorrow we still have to do a part is the celebration 
of the Eucharist. On both sides, we recognize that the time for intercommunion has not yet come. Now, an example of the kind of cooperation of which I'm speaking is exactly this common declaration that we are to affirm tonight on the sanctity of human life to be read to us shortly. This declaration is full of powerful and moving words. May these words be followed by action. This joint declaration is an indication of the degree to which Orthodox and Catholics share together a common heritage, an indication of our closeness to each other. Now, my theme tonight is the recent meetings of the Joint International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. This commission was inaugurated in 1980 on the island of Patmos in the Monastery of St. John, which is in fact the monastery of which I am a member, but I wasn't there in 1980. I've been a member of the commission since 2006, and I've been present at four of the plenary sessions, Belgrade in 2006, Ravenna 2007, Paphos in Cyprus 2009, Vienna 2010. It is not clear when the next plenary session is going to take place. Now this international commission, as its title indicates, involves the whole Catholic Church on the one side and the whole Orthodox communion on the other. There are other dialogues, some of them here in the United States, which involve one local church with another local church. But this international commission, in principle, is pan-Catholic and pan-Orthodox. There are, on the Orthodox side, delegates from every Orthodox church except the Church of Bulgaria, which, for some reason, doesn't send delegates to dialogues, nor, in my experience, do they ever answer letters. <laughs> On the Orthodox side, however, the Orthodox Church in America, the OCA, is not represented because its autocephalous status has not been yet generally recognized throughout the Orthodox Church. So what we have are about 30 delegates from each side, a total of 60. There are two women on the Catholic side, but there are no women on the Orthodox side. Let me share with you one vivid memory of the meetings I've attended. At Ravenna, there were police everywhere. Large numbers of police in uniform outside the doors of the hotel where we were staying. Police along the road which we had to take to go from the hotel to the meeting place for our conversations. Police everywhere. You couldn't cross the road without the police stopping the traffic to help you over. 
and I asked myself, why are there so many police everywhere? Is it to protect the Orthodox delegates from the people of Ravenna? Or is it to protect the people of Ravenna from the Orthodox? <laughs> I didn't find the answer. <laughs> but whether due to the presence of the police or for other reasons, there were no troubles at all. All the conversation proceeded smoothly. But when we met a year later in Paphos, things were different. Here, the police assumed a low profile. They were scarcely in evidence at all. But on the opening day of our conference, there was a demonstration outside the hotel where we were staying, a demonstration of Orthodox zealots who were waving placards saying, orthodoxy or death, or we shall never submit, or the Pope is Antichrist. And I mention that because certainly within the Orthodox Church, our dialogue is not always well understood. Many people think on the Orthodox side, that we who engage in dialogue are going to betray the Orthodox faith, are going to compromise. And that is not at all our intention. I sometimes wish these objectors would read the actual proceedings and then they would change their views. At Vienna, the last meeting, there were no police and no demonstration. I felt a little disappointed. <laughs> One other memory I can share with you is at Paphos, I was given this handsome briefcase, which I take with me everywhere. Usually when you go to a conference, the best you get is a little plastic pencil and perhaps a notepad. Um, <laughs> but on this occasion, we were all given something really useful by the Church of Cyprus. And I note that this briefcase is extremely stout and solid. It will last many years and probably it will need to do so because the dialogue is likely to take quite a long time. <laughs> now, what is the crucial issue in our dialogue? The last occasion when Catholics and Orthodox met at the highest level was in the years 1438 to 39 at the Council of Ferrara, Florence. On that occasion, the two sides occupied some 10 months debating the procession of the Holy Spirit and the addition of the Filioque to the Creed. They devoted about four months to the subject of purgatory and the blessedness of the saints. But to the question of the papal claims, they spent no more than 10 days towards the very end of the council when everybody wanted to go home. <laughs> 10 months for the filioque, 10 days for the papal claims. Such was the order of priorities in the 15th century. Our perspective in the 21st century is altogether different. In the eyes of most Orthodox and of most Catholics, today, the crucial point at issue between our two churches 
is not so much the theology of the Holy Spirit, but the position of the Bishop of Rome within the universal church. In the words of Cardinal Walter Casper, who until recently was president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, and he was co-chairman of our Joint International Commission, for non-Catholic Christians, the papal ministry is the major hindrance on the path towards unity. The main theological problem we now face, he writes, is our shared and different understanding of communio, kinonia. His counterpart, the Orthodox co-chairman of the Joint Commission, Metropolitan John Ziziulas of Pergamon, is in full agreement here. Historically, he says, the question of the papal authority and primacy has been the main cause for the gradual estrangement between the West and the East. The question of primacy undoubtedly lies at the very heart of Roman Catholic Orthodox relations. The ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew is of the same opinion. We have different ecclesiologies, he writes, and the place of the Bishop of Rome in the universal Church of Christ constitutes the principal obstacle. It will be noticed that Cardinal Caspar, Metropolitan John, and the Ecumenical Patriarch all speak of papal primacy rather than papal infallibility as constituting the chief difficulty between Orthodoxy and Rome. Obviously, the question of papal infallibility will also need to be discussed in our dialogue. But there seems to be a general agreement on both sides that we should begin by discussing the subject of primacy. But in fact, in 1980, they didn't begin with that. They wanted to adopt a new approach. At the Council of Ferrara, Florence, the participants began by discussing the points of disagreement. With the current international dialogue, a different approach was adopted. The members of the dialogue, to borrow a phrase later used by Pope John Paul II in his 1995 encyclical Ut Unum Sint, desired to be open to a new situation. They feared that if they were to commence, as at Florence, with the points of disagreement, this would merely result in each party repeating well-worn arguments from the polemical arsenal of the past. They began, therefore, not by considering familiar matters of controversy, but by exploring possible areas of consensus. So in the early statements from the dialogue, there was discussed the significance of the local church, the integral connection between church and Eucharist, the meaning of communion or kinonia, and it was only in 2007 at Ravenna that we began to confront the crucial question of primacy. Now, in its agreed statement, the meeting at Ravenna distinguished three levels of authority, three levels of primacy. First, the local level, the bishop in his diocese. Secondly, regional primacy, 
And for us Orthodox, this means the primacy of the different patriarchs and the different heads of the autocephalous churches. And then at Ravenna, they distinguished a third level of primacy, universal primacy, vested in the Pope. Now, though this may not to Catholic hearers seem very surprising, in fact, this represents something of a breakthrough. In the past, very many Orthodox have altogether denied this third level, the universal primacy of the Pope. They have considered the Pope simply as the most senior among the patriarchs, as the elder brother, as the first among equals. But Ravenna affirms that one should distinguish the position of patriarchs from the position of the Pope. And in fact, the Ravenna statement said quite explicitly, the fact of primacy at the universal level is accepted by both East and West. That affirmation was signed by all the Orthodox delegates at Ravenna. In fact, there was no delegation on that occasion from the Church of Russia, but that was because of difficulties over the Church of Estonia. It had nothing to do with the question of papal primacy. Now, we Orthodox are very keen on emphasizing the importance of councils. We emphasize synodality. But here, the Ravenna statement follows out what was said on many occasions by the Orthodox co-chairman, Metropolitan John Ziziulas. He has repeatedly said, synodality cannot exist without primacy. So the fact of primacy, the universal primacy of the Pope, was accepted at Ravenna by both sides. But Ravenna did not settle the much more difficult question, what kind of primacy? I quote from the Ravenna statement, both sides agree that there was a canonical taxis, a canonical order, recognized by all in the era of the undivided church. Further, they agree that Rome, as the church that presides in love, according to the phrase of St. Ignatius of Antioch, occupied the first place in this taxis or order, and that the Bishop of Rome was therefore first protos among the patriarchs. They disagree, however, on the interpretation of the historical evidence from this early era regarding the prerogatives of the Bishop of Rome as protos, as first, a matter that was already understood in different ways in the first millennium. So the Ravenna statement concludes, primacy at all levels is a practice firmly grounded in the canonical tradition of the church. While the fact of primacy at the universal level is accepted by both East and West, 
There are differences of understanding with regard to the manner in which it is to be exercised, and also with regard to its scriptural and theological foundations. So Ravenna reserved for the future the question, how is the primacy of the Pope to be described? But while it did not explicitly answer the question, what kind of primacy, the Ravenna gathering offers us a precious clue. It quotes Apostolic Canon 34. Now, the Apostolic Canons were not, in fact, written by the Apostles. They date from the late 4th century in their present form. And the 34th Apostolic Canon has immense importance in the Orthodox understanding of the Church. It constitutes, says Metropolitan John Zizulus, nothing less than the golden rule of the theology of primacy. And this is what the 34th Apostolic Canon says. I'm sure some of the Orthodox clergy present know this canon by heart. No doubt some of them repeat it every night before they go to sleep. But <laughs> it's less well known in the Latin West. The bishops of each province, it says, must recognize the one who is first among them and consider him to be their head and not do anything important without his consent. Each bishop may only do what concerns his own diocese and its dependent territories. But the first cannot do anything without the consent of all. For in this way, concord will prevail and God will be praised through the Lord in the Holy Spirit. There at the end, you have the very important notion of the church as an image or icon of the Holy Trinity. But notice the principle in this canon. It is that of reciprocity and mutual concord. Now this canon refers to regional primacy. The bishops in each region and the chief bishop within that region. To the second of the three levels that Ravenna distinguished. But in the Ravenna statement, it is hinted, not stated explicitly, that this canon could also be applied to the authority of the Pope. Now, notice the principle, yes, of reciprocity and mutual concord that is affirmed in this canon. The bishops are to recognize the one who is first. And in a reunited Christendom, there is clearly only one bishop who could be recognized as first, the Bishop of Rome. The bishops are not to do anything important without the consent of the one who is first. But at the same time, the one who is first is not to do anything without the consent of all. So Ravenna suggests, without stating it explicitly, that here is a model for papal primacy. The Bishop of Rome is first, but he needs to act always in consultation with the other bishops. It's not a question of one-sided domination with the Pope as the supreme ruler who issues ordinances while the regional primates, the patriarchs, the heads of the autocephalous churches and the diocesan bishops are submissively obedient. On the contrary, there is to be mutuality and co-responsibility. 
The bishops cannot function without the Pope, but if you apply Canon 34, the apostolic canons, the Pope cannot function without the bishops. Now, there are problems here. At the First Vatican Council, it was clearly affirmed that the Pope could act without the bishops. And this was reaffirmed by Vatican II in the document Lumen Gentium. As the prefatory note of explanation states in that dogmatic constitution, as supreme pastor of the church, the sovereign pontiff can always exercise his authority as he chooses. Whereas the Episcopal College, it says, acts only at intervals and with the consent of the head. Now this obviously is not the kind of reciprocity envisaged by Apostolic Canon 34 and the Ravenna Statement. Here is a matter that will require further clarification in our future discussions. So all our difficulties are not in fact solved. And of course, the statement of Ravenna, recognizing the universal primacy of the Pope, has to be received by the various Orthodox churches and by the Catholic Church this process of reception, at any rate on the Orthodox side, is likely to take a long time. That's why I need a very solid briefcase. <laughs> There's likely to be opposition to the Ravenna statement, not least from monastic circles on Mount Athos. But there may also be problems of reception on the Roman Catholic side from the Holy Office. To adapt the words of Winston Churchill after the Battle of Britain in the Second World War, we are not yet at the end of our journey. We are not even at the beginning of the end, but perhaps we have reached the end of the beginning. Now, since Ravenna, we've begun to carry out the program indicated there, to look at history. What has been the role of the Bishop of Rome in the communion of the churches during the first millennium? And that is not altogether a simple question to answer. Catholics and Orthodox have different ways of interpreting church history. Even in the first millennium, at a time of full communion between East and West, there are already in the two halves of Christendom divergent manners of understanding the papacy. And if I had time, I would illustrate that by referring to the relations between Pope Leo the Great and the Council of Chalcedon. There was diversity of understanding in the first millennium regarding the ministry of the Bishop of Rome. And so a question before us now is, how far can we allow diversity today without impairing Eucharistic communion? Now, we've prepared a working paper which was discussed at Paphos and at Vienna but it's not a very satisfactory paper. Most of us don't feel very happy about it. And perhaps we should turn away from history because it's very difficult to agree about history and look more at theology again. However, if your theology is not based on history, it is built on sand. So, what conclusion are we to draw from all this? There is a Hindu saying, the gods hate what is obvious and love what is obscure. And that is probably true of our dialogue. At Florence, only 10 days were spent on the papal claims. 
we are certainly going to need longer than that. Are we making progress? Yes. But the progress is undoubtedly slow. However, we may recall the wise words of a notable Orthodox pioneer in the movement for Christian unity, the Russian archpriest, George Florovsky. He said, the greatest ecumenical virtue is patience. But I would like to add, an impatient patience, a patient impatience. Thank you. <laughs>